That's good. Well, <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And uh, welcome. I'm glad you came here today. As you can tell I have a little bit of a frog in my throat. And, uh, but I am so glad to get out of my sick cave. I don't know how you guys are when you're sick, but when I'm sick, I'm, I belong in a cave. I'm a grumpy bear, and I just, <laughs> just uh, nail the door shut and open it up when I'm feeling better. So, uh, praise God. I'm glad we have, God has provided so many talented people here who love him and can preach and share the word. And so, I had it, Mike and uh, Elite on the Sunday, they do pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I heard. I heard it was a beautiful service. And so, I'm sorry I missed it. Praise God, but I'm here tonight, so you Amen. get to put up with me tonight. Amen. So if you would, let's open up our Bibles then to uh, First Chronicles, chapters 14 and 15 for tonight. I actually came up with a couple of different titles for these, these two chapters. You know, I, don't know, I, I, I don't know why, but I just have a lot of fun coming up with titles for chapters. Even on Sunday morning, you know, I'll, 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 have, I'll, I'll have the top of my sheet and I'll have like three or four different titles for my sermon and then I'll kind of, as I go along, I decide which one fits the best. <clears throat> but uh, after, after studying, after completing my study, I thought to myself, I'd really like to name these two uh, chapters, Give Me a Heart for Worship. Mm -hmm be a heart for worship. So that's really what I'm calling these two. And I think uh, by the end of uh, chapter 15, we'll see exactly why that would be. But I'll, I have another title for this, uh, for these two chapters. And uh, But in order for you to know what that title is, you're going to have to participate. You're going to have to help me out. And I'm much of a voice, so I'm only going to give you half the title, and you give me the second half. It's actually an old saying. So I'll give you the first part, and then you finish it off for me. Are you ready? If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Try, try again. There it is. And actually, uh, I have come to find that uh, that is just an excellent Christian principle that fits so well into how we live and how we serve the Lord. I remember years ago, uh, I used to work for AT&T, and years ago when I very first got hired, and I think... I got a job there first when I was like 19 years old, and uh, <laughs> no clue what they saw in me, but very they, they promoted me rather quickly, and uh, uh, I really didn't had no clue what I was doing whatsoever. <laughs> they probably promoted me too quickly. I don't think I was even 21. I had gotten a nice promotion that the other folks were really scrapping over with, and they. I had some few people upset with me, and I just kind of like shrugged my shoulders, and I was like, I don't know why I have this job either. Don't get upset at me, you know. And uh, the fellow who was my boss at the time, I had a really great boss, and his name was Heber Jones. Is that a great name? Mm -hmm. Heber Jones. <laughs> it almost seems like it should be the name of a book, you know, The Life of Heber Jones, you know. But he was a great boss to work for. He was just uh, kind-hearted and... He was just about to retire, and so he had like 40 plus years of service for Mom Bell, and he was getting ready to retire. And I remember that I had made some really big error. I did something really wrong. I, I can't even remember what it was, but I do remember the incident that I did something bad. <laughs> and uh, I was very upset with myself, and I was also very nervous to see what would happen. And a Heber took me into his office, and he closed the office door, and I was totally expecting the worst. And he said, uh, Paul, you made a mistake, and that's how we learn from our mistakes. Uh, he went on to say, don't be surprised in your career when you make mistakes. Be surprised when you don't make mistakes. And uh, what a great boss he was. I remember I, after that incident, I went and got him a little gift, you know, which he was very appreciative of. Eber Jones, God bless him. I'll get to see him in heaven. So uh, in my years of service to the Lord and serving God, I, I've come to find out that, that that is absolutely true. That we make a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes in ministry. And God uses those to teach us. So I'm never surprised when somebody makes a mistake in ministry. 
I'm surprised when people don't make mistakes. And that's, that's where I learned that. So if first you don't succeed, try, try uh, again. That's the way that it works. It fits for us. A lot of times somebody will come into ministry and, uh, you know, you just really, now when I see people coming into ministry, I just kind of like waiting for them to, to make their mistakes that God will teach them from, you know. It's inevitable. And, uh, but oftentimes the sad part of ministry and being a pastor, see somebody come into ministry and they're all excited. And then they make their mistake or mistakes. They rub somebody the wrong way or they say the wrong thing or whatever it is they try to do is an absolute flop, you know. And, uh, and then, uh, or people don't get excited as they are, you know. Because whatever God calls you to do, you're going to be far more excited than anybody else. You know, that's how it works, right? So, the, uh, so uh, and even in the church, you see all the... Pastors think everybody should be teaching, and uh, all the drummers think everybody should be drumming. Why do everybody want to do this, you know? Don't they feel the call of God, you know, to, to whatever it is, Drum. be an usher or be an elder or whatever? And they don't. <laughs> you do. That's why you feel that way. So, uh, uh, at any rate, uh, they'll say uh, that, that, that trouble will come, and they'll go, that's it. I'm, I'm done. I'll never do that again. I'll, you know. I'll never put myself out there in ministry again. Well, don't do that. Let's, let's, let's absolutely learn not to do that. And tonight we have an excellent example. If you remember last time we were together in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, we found that David came up with his plan in order to move the ark. David had a great idea. He wanted to move the ark. He wanted to move the ark to Jerusalem. The city used to be called Jebus. Uh, David knew the territory really well. It was right smack, and it is right smack dab in the middle of Israel. <coughs> and that was going to be their capital. Changed the name to Jerusalem or Zion in the northern hill territory. A place of worship, a place where everybody gathers together. So they took the city, and, and David has this great plan, and he's going to bring the ark, which had been taken by the Philistines. He's going to bring it back to Jerusalem, and and what a great idea. And everybody's for it. Now exciting. The only problem is, is that uh, David had his own plan for bringing the presence, what symbolized the presence of God, to Jerusalem. And it wasn't God's plan. And uh, the big gap here was the fact that David didn't pray and he didn't consult the word of God. Uh, something that we all do. You know. So here's David. David, you know, I don't know. Uh, when I make a mistake, I want nobody to notice. <laughs> Which I'll tell you. Tell you right now, if you're in ministry, uh, forget it. <laughs> You'll make all your mistakes in public. <laughs> and there are things that I said that I'd like to pull back, and I can't. You guys get to watch me be an idiot in one area or another. And then I go home and I go, oh, I don't believe I did that. I don't believe I said that. Or my wife will go, do you know what you said today from the pulpit? And I'll say, what did I say? Then she'll tell me, like, oh, I didn't say that. She goes, yes, you did. Watch the tape. <laughs> yeah, watch the video. Oh, oh boy. So you, in ministry, you get to make all your public, uh, all your mistakes in public with somebody watching. You. So you need to be, uh, uh, to be in ministry, you have to thick skin. Wouldn't you say that? Oh, one? man. Yeah. Alligator hide. Huh. You got to have alligator hide. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> don't, don't get into ministry if you're in any way thin-skinned because uh, it's going to hurt. <laughs> so David had brought the whole, the whole, everybody together, almost the whole country together to watch the ark go back to Jerusalem. Or to, to be set up in Jerusalem, and uh, and of course it was a tremendous flop. I mean, David did everything wrong. He had everybody out there, and they were all ready for a big party. And Uzzah put out his hand, you know, and uh, tried to catch the ark because the ark, the cart stumbled, the the, the oxen stumbled, and that was it for him. He was smoked in. We talked about that last time. Get the tape, we'll watch the video. We talked about that at length. But uh, so David just leaves the ark there, and David is mad. So really, the chapter ends with David mad. He's like, "How? What is that?" And I think his question was, "How can I bring the ark of God to Jerusalem?" Which was the perfect question. In fact, that's that's what we do when we pray for revival or for God to move in our midst. How can we move to get the presence of God to you know to here or to there? Or this group or that group? So that hasn't changed. But. I'll tell you what, let's just go for it, shall we? First Chronicles 14. Yeah. <clears throat> now Hiram, king of Tyre, 
sent messengers to David, and not only did he send messengers, look what he sends with them. Cedar trees. Uh, you know, these trees are just, I mean, and they live for, you know, a couple thousand years, I don't know, 800, it's a mature tree when it's about 800 years old. Can you imagine that? I think I'll plant a cedar tree in the backyard. <laughs> you, won't, you won't see. Because of the beauty of a cedar tree is that once it gets tall enough, uh, it fattens out yeah. so that it's straight all the way up, you know. Uh, so you can have a couple hundred feet of this giant tree, you know, just gorgeous. But uh, what my, my joy or my thought was is that God knew exactly what trees. He planted them. And they only grow in certain climate and certain, you know, they, you can't, I don't, even, I don't even know that you could plant a cedar tree around here. You might be able to plant one on the coast, possible, but I'm not quite sure. But it has to have all the right elements. So God knew right where to put those trees. And I'm sure that 800 years before this, when the little sproutling came up, you know, the Lord probably looked at that little sproutling coming up and said, you know, that's going to be David's palace. Or another one little one comes up and the Lord's like, oh, those are going to be used in the making of the temple, you know. But anyway, he sends these cedar trees, and not only cedar trees, but <clears throat> masons, very skillful, carpenters, you know. All the uh, contractors and subcontractors were there. Uh, the guys that do the drywall, no, they didn't have drywall. <laughs> used to work drywall. And uh, to build him a house. So uh, the king, uh, the king in the north, Hiram, which becomes very close to David, they're very good friends. Uh, he sends him all the fixings, all the to dos that uh, David needs uh, to build himself a palace. And it really, in, in the midst of all of this, I, the Lord is working behind the scenes. Because what's going to happen is David's going to have this magnificent palace. And one day he's going to be out on the terrace of his palace and he's going to look down and he's going to see the beautiful tent with the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where the priest is. And he's going to go, oh my gosh, why should I live in this great place? And yet the Lord and I have him stuck in a tent down there, so to speak. But uh, that, that will encourage David then to gather all the wherewithal, kind of like Hiram, not doing the building, but gathering all the wherewithal uh, for his son Solomon to do the building. Here's the interesting thing. When David first comes into being king, he is the king of about 6,000 uh, square miles. That, that, that's, uh, I don't know if that sounds big or not to you, but by the time David is in full swing, he's in charge of 60,000 <laughs> square miles. So uh, pretty, a pretty, pretty remarkable things are going to happen here. Uh, uh, so as far as palaces are concerned in Israel, this is a whole new deal. So uh, here we go, verse 2. <laughs> I've got to pick up the pace here, don't I? <laughs> verse 2, so David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, for his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people. I love that, that verse. It's a beautiful verse. It gives us insight into the heart of David and also David's tremendous understanding of who God is and who David was in relationship to God. Uh, David didn't say something like we see some of the other kings say, wow, aren't I something? And boy, I'm really, boy, I've got my act together and look at how great I am and how what, I'm being exalted. I must be something special. So first of all, David had kind of a calm assurance. That's what I see here. It says, David knew that the Lord had established him. We love that. We you know, say that, love to say that about your own life. I know that God has established me. I know that God has put me where he's put me. I, I trust all that he, that everything that I have has come from his hand. I know what he's done. I, ju I just have this inner peace and calm assurance. That's what David had about the Lord, right where he want, right where God wanted him to be. And he knew that it was the Lord that has done the whole thing. He knew that the Lord had done what he had done through David because God loves his people. So David never looked for anything for himself here. This is really nice. Uh, but and then we turn right around and we take a look at one of David's weaknesses in verse 3. Then David took more wives in Jerusalem. 
and, and David begot more sons and daughters. So the Lord had expressly told them, and I believe that was uh, Deuteronomy 7 or 17, one of those, that uh, when you come into the land, you have a king, do not multiply. Well, there was like three things, wasn't it? The gold, the girls. Yeah. And horses. <laughs> and horses. horses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no horsing around. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, David just, uh, this is David's weakness here. Here's what uh, one Bible commentator had to say. The Bible commentator's name is Payne, by the way. <laughs> Isn't that great? P-A-Y-N-E, Payne. He says that, <clears throat> that David took more wives was a historical fact, but a moral failure, directly contrary to the law. This sin led to a whole series of disasters later on. Pain. Verse 4, and these are the names of the children whom he had in Jerusalem. First one is named as Shamua. And I think he was called that because he was big and he liked to swim. Uh, <laughs> no, possible. Then there was Shobab and Nathan and Solomon. You know that name there, don't you? Ibhar, Elishua, Elpilet, uh, Naga. Nafig, Jephiah, El Shama, Beliadad, Beliada, and Eliphelet. <laughs> there you go. Good job. Great names. Thank you. I didn't do too bad with that, did I? <laughs> it has to be noted when it comes to David. If you think about David and the troubles that he had in his life, really, the troubles David had all came from his wives and his children. That was, you know, if you removed that whole chunk of trouble, you would say, oh my gosh, David was like this, you know, and he had very much feet of clay, and that's where his problem was. Uh, the other thing that I, I might make mention of interesting in David's life is that David was most, I guess you could say, most right on when things were most difficult. Yeah. Do you notice that? Yeah. It's an interesting thing, huh? And the better things got for David, I'm talking about success or wealth, that he was, that he would, it, was, it was a bigger trial for him to have things go well than it was for him to have things go wrong. And uh, so it's really, I, I cracked a hold of that today. I thought to myself, well, you know, sometimes I see a lot of folks with troubles in their lives, you know, especially uh, being a pastor, but folks will come to you and get calls. I got an email today, which long email about some troubles in somebody's life. And, and I thought to myself, maybe, who knows, maybe that trouble comes along because that will keep that person calling up the Lord. It keep them close. It will keep them close. Because if you gave that person everything they wanted and the freedom that they want, they might self-destruct, you know. So, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, okay, let's. Uh, oh, so we're leaving that. Let's go on to verse eight. Now, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, north and south, all the Philistines went up to search for David, and David heard of it and went out against them. Uh, here's the problem. Uh, the Philistines uh, d didn't have that much of a problem with David, which is kind of interesting when he was just king in the southern region. And uh, they didn't take too much mind of him. <coughs> they kind of seemed to like him to some extent, you know. David never really squared off with them. They never really squared off with him until he became king over all of Israel. And at that point, it was at that point that they, they saw him as a threat. And so when they saw him as a threat, now they come out and they're just lined up and they're, they're trying to show who's boss. And of course, that's going to end up be a big mistake on their part because God's boss. But I would say this, uh, in our lives, uh, sometimes when God is going to use you, you're not the only one that knows it. Or maybe you don't even know it. Maybe the enemy might even see it before, before you see it. And so a lot of times spiritual warfare will come because God wants to use your life. The enemy goes, oh boy, I need to show this guy, this gal, who's boss before they think they can do something, you know. And so the enemy might score off with you just a horrible way right at the start, you know, right at the get-go to, uh, 
<coughs> well, excuse me, try and shut you down, but it's the enemy's <coughs> mistake. As long as you continue to lean on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Verse 9, Then the Philistines went and made a raid on the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God. See, I like that a lot. David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Here's his prayer then. Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to him, Go up, for I will deliver them into your hand. I don't know if David heard this directly. I don't know if there was a prophet there that spoke to him, or one of the priests, whatever the case may be. David prays, and I think it's beautiful. Take note. This, this is the first thing that he does, is he prays. Amen. Uh, and I, I would say that this is what makes David a great king. Because as we went through First and Second Kings, how many times did we see a king do something and we said, all right, what should this king have done first? <laughs> he should have inquired of the Lord, you know. But then I wonder, how many times can that be applied to our own lives? Mm -hmm. you know? Did we inquire of the Lord first, not as a last resort, but as a first resort? Uh, also, it tells me this, that David had, had an alive relationship with God. A situation came up, David says, oh, Lord, what do I do here? You know, there was, some, there was an open dialogue and there was a communication. And I think sometimes we as Christians can get into some kind of a routine where we're not taking advantage of our personal relationship with the Lord daily, ongoing, every moment. God wants to have a relationship with you personally, you know. He doesn't just want to talk to Billy Graham. <laughs> he wants to walk with you. So verse 11, so they went up to Baal Perizim, and David defeated them there. Then David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a breaking through of water. Therefore, then this is why, they called the name of that place Baal Parism, which could literally be translated, I like this translation, Master of Breakthroughs. <laughs> Master of breakthroughs. And that's who God is to be to us, the master of breakthroughs. But there's, okay, let's see if we can get the picture here. David gets so excited about what he sees, and what he sees is almost like a dam bursting. You get a picture of that, or a levee breaking, and the water just spilling through. So from that, we get the idea that David just went head on with the Philistines. And God did what he said he was going to do, gave the victory. And David goes, must have been saying, man, we just busted right through them. They just, we just, you know, like, like water, we just gushed right through them. And so let's call this place Baal Parism. Uh, so that was, seems to have been uh, the battle plan at that time. Uh, verse 12. And when they left their gods there, <laughs> okay. That's kind of funny. You should at least, you can, if you have a God and you can outrun him. He's probably God. Him. God. You know. <laughs> so uh, David gives the command and they burn him with fire, which is exactly what they were told to do. Come into the land, you find some idols, uh, then just burn them, you know. Uh, so there you go. <clears throat> But I will say this, as I look at this, <laughs> I'll say this as I look at this, and that is that uh, they did carry their gods into battle. In other words, I get the clue here that they're unashamed uh, of their gods, and they just went right into battle, or whatever they looked like, or whatever they carried. <coughs> and I think about us, and I think we have the one true living God. We have no excuse for ever being ashamed of serving God. You know, just don't be. Just do not be afraid. Look, uh, uh, we saw what the world, how the world treated and what the world did to Jesus Christ while he was here. So we know the world's idea of how to treat Jesus. And we know what the world will do. Well, look, Jesus in you will be treated just like 
Jesus was treated when he was here. Does that make sense to you? So don't ever be surprised that, gee, who's, I'm so loving and kind and I only want to do good. You know, why are they so mad at me, you know? Just don't even let that enter into your thought. But I think last day saints, we, we need to be, you know, bold and uh, just carry Christ with you. <clears throat> The Philistines once again made a raid on the valley, and I just stopped there, and I go, wait a minute. Did, did, didn't they just get Valparaiso? They just got whooped. What are they doing back there again? And so let me ask you, have you ever seen a great victory from the Lord on a particular battlefield? And then you turn right around, and there's the enemy again doing the same stupid thing that they did last you go, what? Oh, yeah. Huh? <laughs> well, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, here we go again. And you're just like, transmission. you're like, wait a minute. This, You know, Lord, you gave me a great victory. I know it was you who gave me that victory. I pray you gave me a word. I I followed it. I, and if, So why do I have to face this thing all over again? Training. Yeah, part of it can be training. Also, I want to let you know that the enemy knows... If at first you don't succeed, <laughs> try, try again. That's right. So you're, you're, we are to take with us what we learned before into this new thing. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, God will be with you again. But he, here's the very interesting thing that I find. So, so there the Philistines are again, verse 14. Therefore David inquired again of God. <laughs> See, uh, mm -hmm. Some people might not have done that. They might have said, oh, you're back again? Well, yeah, Val, Val Parizo. Get everybody, get in a wedge. We're going forward, you know, we're going to tear through the... David didn't do that. Because remember, he has a vital, daily, alive relationship with God. So he calls on God again. And he's, uh, again, and God said to him, you shall not go up after them. This is going to be a different plan. Looks the same, but don't go up after them again. Instead, <coughs> circle around them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. That's a real interesting thing. Uh, these mulberry trees. I'm thinking that there's some kind of a connection between David and the mulberry trees. I think there's some kind of a, you know, not only, well, okay, first of all, just from a military aspect, what, David, what David's being told is, not head on, you're going to flank them. They won't even see this coming. You're going to come, you're not, you know, you're following me, I'm in charge. And as we covered this story before, if you remember from, uh, where were we? Second Kings, I can't remember. Uh, when we covered this once before, he was going to hear a rustling in the trees, remember? Oh, yeah. Almost like the footsteps of angels or the footsteps of the Lord. If, when you hear that rustling, then you go, but you go around this side way. So I need to have my eyes open. I need to be connected. I need to be inquiring of the Lord, even if I've had a victory before in exactly the same situation, exactly the same circumstance. God, what do you want me to do this time? How do you want me to play it this time, Lord? Verse 15, And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. I'd like to hear that, wouldn't you? Yep. <laughs> then you shall go out to battle. For God has gone out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So it almost seems as though God's going to do it and you're just going to come in and clean up afterwards. That's right. So... It's like, don't charge right in this time. So now, now the situation happens again. I don't know. Maybe you're hearing from the Lord. You're inquiring of God. God says, I want you to hang back a little. And let me do something. And you need to be sensitive and aware. When God's going to jump in there and do something, then you're just going to, wow, look what God did. God marched right in there and took care of it. And when you're to charge in, so be aware of that. Good lesson here. Uh, verse 16, so David did as God commanded him. That's a smart thing to do, isn't it? <clears throat> Could be said of each one of us, you know. So so Paul did as God commanded him. Oh, I'd love to hear that. And they drove back the army of the Philistines from Gibeon 
as far as Gezer. <coughs> and then the fame of David went out to all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. But recall, though, we've got it in this chapter here, that even though the Lord is doing this, and it looks like the fame of David and, and the fear of David, you know, but what do we know? We know that David knew that it was because the Lord had established him as king over Israel, for his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people. This is a hard one, you know. It's a hard one for all of us to really get to the point of understanding that all the glory goes to God. Don't, don't, don't try to get in front of any of that. Uh, it's also very freeing because when you understand that all the glory goes to God, that it you know, that it's totally not about you. It never was about you. It never will be about you. Uh, the one who made the biggest error in that area was, of course, Satan, thinking that it was about him. Well, look at how special I am, and uh, he still hasn't figured that one out. Okay. Uh, so here we go then on to First Chronicles 15. Now, when David left the ark at the house of Obed-Edom, that guy starts getting blessed. It was only a three-month period of time that it was there. So uh, uh, Obed-Edom, uh, by the way, means ruddy servant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ruddy servant, that's what that means. Kind of a, in fact, it was said of David <coughs> when, his, uh, uh, when uh, Samuel found him, uh, when he was a young kid out being a shepherd, it says he was ruddy. And it, it kind of carries with it the idea of, you know, red, you know, ruddy, red. It also carries with it kind of the idea of being outdoor, just kind of a, you know, run amok, kind of a, you know, uh, just uh, not unpolished, uh, you know, just a ruddy servant. And I, and I wonder if David did it, think back to the time at which he was just a ruddy servant, you know. So Obed-Edom is this guy that's just getting blessed because the Ark of the Covenant is sitting there at his house for this period of time. So David's going uh, uh, David's going to take another swing at this, get the Ark back to Jerusalem. Verse 1 of uh, 1 Chronicles 15, David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the Ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites. I read that and just go ding, 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 <laughs> and bingo. You know, lights flashing. David, you got it. David must have been consulting the word of God, don't you think? Yeah. Read the manual. <laughs> I also, if I was David, I'd be pretty upset at the Levites, wouldn't you? Or the high priest? Who would how come they didn't step forward and say, you know, David, Karch, Mart, you better not do that. <laughs> There's only one group <coughs> that's to carry this ark. But apparently, uh, they're all going to learn a lesson here. Uh, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. There are uh, three very important positions, uh, particularly in the Old Testament. And those uh, three very important positions are uh, prophet and uh, king and priest. Those are the three important positions. In fact, uh, you know, when we talk, we're just past Christmas here, so when we talk about the gifts that the Magi brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, well, those are representative of those three offices. There's only one person who holds those three offices, and that's Jesus Christ. But David comes pretty close because he holds two of those offices, one of a prophet. You can go to the Old Testament, and particularly go to the Psalms, and, you know, David is speaking, but it's not David, it's Jesus, you know, and uh, just in just dramatic, you know, profound uh, kind of way, Psalm 22, for instance. So, uh, David was definitely a prophet, and also a king, a king like no other, just a great king, God's pick for king. 
But I, I would think that David, and I think we're going to see some evidence of it here, I think that David would have given all that up if he could have been a priest. Yeah. Like Samuel, you know. Just to be that close to the Lord. Just to be right there in the presence of God. Just to be ministering to the Lord. I think it was really big on David's heart for that. Uh, verse 3. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. Now, if you had just made a huge mistake, a huge flop, I and mean, the first time you tried to do this, the fella, one of the fellows got killed, it cost somebody their life. Uh, how would you do it the second time? Do you think you would give, tell everybody, or do you think you just invite a few close friends? <laughs> We're going to have a gathering of three people. <laughs> uh, David is so sure here. So this is really an act of faith. He is so sure of what he's now read from the Word of God and understands how that ark is to be moved that, uh, in fact, it was every six paces, so they didn't move very far before they had to do another sacrifice, and then oh, they carried another, right. I mean, amazing, you know. So, uh, but David is so sure of it that he gathers everybody together once again for this huge celebration, a big celebration. I think that I, I as I've looked at this and studied it, uh, I think to myself, I, I would not be surprised if this would be considered the greatest day in the nation of Israel, this day here. Mm. Uh, they're in the land, uh, their enemies are at bay, uh, they've selected a capital, they have the king that God wants, uh, the priests are all read up on the word, and now the Ark of the Covenant is gonna come where it's gonna rest, and where the temple's gonna be built. I think, I think the excitement on this particular day was palpable, and I'll put it right on par with uh, the day that the temple was uh, dedicated, the Temple of Solomon. So I think this is just an awesome, awesome day. Verse 4, then David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites. Okay, now you're talking. Now all the descendants of Aaron, of course, are all... Uh, he's in the priestly line. <laughs> and so he gets all of, them, all of them together. And so this is quite exciting stuff. And verse 5, And the sons of Kohath, are you remembering? Do you remember the name Kohath? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Uriel, <coughs> the chief, and 120 of his brethren. The son of Merari, remember them? Ahaziah, the chief, and 220 of the brethren, sons of Gershom. Remember Gershom? Mm -hmm. We joked about that. We called them Gershom and Sons Moving Company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were in charge. Remember, these are the guys that move all the parts of the temple. And I think it's, the, I think it's Gershom and Sons that they, they, uh, <clears throat> they cover the ark. And I think that they walk backwards. I'm not quite sure. And then they to cover it, cover it they, so that they don't look at it. Right. Well, that's right. You're just studying through Genesis. I'm in there right now. Are you? Okay. <laughs> they, they, <coughs> that's how you do it. And now they're doing it right. And and, and it goes on to list uh, other names of the priests. Verse 8, uh, the sons of uh, Elizaphan, uh, Shemaiah, the chief, and 200 of the brethren, the sons of... Uh, Hebron, Eliel the chief, 800 of his brethren, the son of Uziel, uh, Minadab the chief, and 100, 112 of his brethren. And David called for Zadok, oh, here we go, the priest, and Abiathar the priests, and the Levites for Uriel, Ahaziah, Joel, and they leave, look at, he lists their names again. You know what this is kind of like? This is kind of like, uh, you know, when you're going to take a flight on a plane. If you're taking a small a flight on a small plane, mm -hmm. him, the guy gets out the checklist, you know, and he says, all right, how much do you weigh? And it gives everybody weighs, you know, and what did you bring on with you? And, you know, fuel, check, you know, lights, check, brakes, check. 
I think that's that's kind of what's going on here. You know, do we have the right guys? Are they in the right place? Do we have the right priest? Check, check, and double check. Verse 12, he said to them, all right, this is, oh, this is cool. David now, before he moves the ark, he says to everybody, you're the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. <coughs> Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, <coughs> sorry, that you may bring the ark of the Lord of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. Isn't that interesting? Thank you, a cough drop. I love it. <laughs> I shall partake. <laughs> Was that a sanctified cough drop? Yes, mm -hmm. sir. All right. So he tells them, sanctify yourself. Sanctify yourself has the idea of removing uncleanness. It's being separate to the Lord. You know, we went through the whole sanctification process, which we're currently in the sanctification process, each one of us. But set your sides, selves apart to serve the Lord. And it's interesting, it says, you and your brethren. You notice that? Mm -hmm. So he puts, he puts upon them, and I like that, kind of a responsibility. Not only are you responsible to sanctify yourself, but I'm giving you some responsibility towards your brethren, too. Make sure that you guys are in this together. Be accountable to each other. This is going to be an act of unity. Uh, <clears throat> so that's pretty, he's like, you want to serve the Lord? You're going to jump in? Awesome. I want you to pray, see what the Word of God says, and check yourself. That's what each one of us do today. Want to jump in and serve the God, the Lord? Pray, see what the Word says, and check yourself. Are you right? Is your heart right? What's the reason why you're wanting to do what you want to do for the Lord? Mm -hmm. Make sure that you, you do not have a two-by-four in your eye, <laughs> as Jesus said. Verse 13, for because you did not do so, see, he's calling them on it here. For because you did not do so, priests, <laughs> did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us, because we did not consult him about the proper order that, that's that's a lot in that verse right there for each one of us to take to our own hearts uh, this is one very sad verse in one sense but also a precious verse to us and I think as I look at verse 13 oh what trouble we could avoid in our lives and in our marriages and in raising our kids and at work and in our marriages and on and on I can go what trouble we could avoid if we would first of all consult God about what? Everything. It says proper order. So remember, our God is a God of order. So it's like, I, I think that there's part of us that wants to be able to charge off and do things on our own, you know, merit or our own ability or, you know solve the riddle ourselves or you know what I mean oh I can handle that oh I can do that no oh, I'm quicker than most or whatever the case may be I can do that. that's not a problem I don't even need to pray let's just, let's just take care of it uh, that's so wrong <laughs> because God has an order for everything even your job <laughs> even your desk <laughs> you know even the things that you do during the day Consult God about the proper order. He's a God of order. I mean, look at the look at the fallen universe and everything's all out of whack, but still we marvel at the complexity of it, you know. And even people who don't know God marvel at the complexity of the universe or the complexity of, of uh, DNA or the genome, you know. You you hear it over and over again, even from people who don't, even from people who who uh, believe in evolution, mm -hmm. uh, poor souls, uh, they'll, they'll say, look at the design. Isn't it magnificent? Mm -hmm. And you go, yeah, yeah, you're close. Look at the order, mm -hmm. you know? And they'll go right down, and then they'll say, oh, it just kind of instantly happened mm -hmm. over millions of years. But uh, we know that God is a God of order. Verse 14, so the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves See, I think there was repenting there. I think there was an individual seeking of God there. I think there was a laying aside of pride. 
I think they burned that stupid cart that they had put together in the first place. Mm -hmm. Sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bore the ark, where? On their shoulders, by poles, as Moses had commanded, how? According to the word of the Lord. See, that's the order. Verse 13 says, seek God for his proper order. And then verse 15, there it is. You want to notice something here? Is that both Old Testament and New Testament, God has ordered that his name, that his presence, that his gospel, that his word be carried forth by his people. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's how God has intended to do it. Uh, not by some show, not by some cart, not by some, you know, uh, program. And I, I think I've shared with you before, I get these things in the mail, how to have a successful church, you know, the most successful servants are. Well, well so you have a lot of people that have actually used these techniques. And, you know, I don't know if you know, but the name and claimants are falling apart right now. Mm -hmm. You know, their churches and their, their, you know, there's a couple of jets parked right over here at uh, John Wayne that are for sale. You know, because not enough little people are sending in their money, you know. And uh, uh, I think that God is showing that, that, that that's, you can't, God is the one in charge. That's right. You cannot order God, otherwise you've put the whole thing on its head. He's not a genie. He's not Santa, you know. You can name and claim it until you're blue in the face, but if God is not intended for that to happen, it's not going to happen. It's not for you. And I think the other thing that we see kind of falling apart right now is also the, uh, the what we call the emergent church, what I like to call the submergent church. It's not working. And they, they thought somehow, oh, well, what we need to do is, well, first of all, we need to look cool. I'm just giving you what I see. We need to look cool. We need to have the 52 sermons that all work. And we need to bring everybody in, you know, kind of regardless of belief. And that's falling apart right now. And so God is still looking at Jesus said for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. So uh, we're to carry forth the Lord on our shoulders. Carry him forth. We carry the Lord. Verse 16. Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers, accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, and cymbals, by raising the, the voice with resounding joy. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, boy, I love that. You know, David says, let's get out there and worship, you know. Let's praise God. And I think looking at verse 16, I think to myself, well, of course, it's one of the reasons why we love worship around here so much, you know. Just lift up God's name. We can't lift his name up high enough. So uh, uh, let's drop down to... Then he begins to list the names of these people. And I'm not going to butcher all these names for you. Not only that, my, I'm sorry, my nose has begun to run. You drop down to verse uh, 16, it lists, uh, verse uh, 19, it lists some of the singers. Some of you may know He Man, mm -hmm. very strong guy. <laughs> strong <Lord. laughs> He actually has a psalm, his own psalm. You want to look up his oh, psalm. Asaph he is, uh, it seems as though there was kind of a thing between David and Asaph where David may have written some of the words and then Asaph would come along and supply the music afterwards, or vice versa, something like that. That was a musical family. Mm -hmm. And then Ethan, where the, where the sound of the cymbals were to sound the cymbals of bronze. So uh, this guy here just went bang, you know? <laughs> you know? Sound guy was always asking him to turn it down, but that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, then in uh, verse 20, you can see uh, the stringed instruments there, and then uh, verse 21, harps, <laughs> verse 22. Look at the end of verse 22. These uh, folks in charge of the music, this fellow, because he was skillful, 
That's kind of interesting. And I, I just point that out because they wanted to give God the very best. And then, uh, then it lists a couple of fellows here who are doorkeepers, and that, of course that makes me think of one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 84, where David says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. And then uh, in verse 24, you can see down about the middle, it says these are priests who were to blow the trumpets before the ark of God. Look who gets in there. Obed-Edom. <laughs> He's got a job. That's the fellow that had the ark. He gets to blow the trumpet and this other fellow, and they get to be doorkeepers for the ark. Uh, interesting. Really, the job of the doorkeeper of the ark was to not let anybody in who wasn't supposed to be in there. So these guys are like the safety monitors, you know? Yes. Uh, they're like, I wouldn't touch that if I were here. <laughs> uh, so, uh, praise God. Really, these last several verses, I look at them and I think to myself, we could do that here at uh, CC Live, particularly on a Sunday morning. Where I could just list all the names of those people and the places where God had put them and what they do and you know, the ushers and the sound and the worshipers. And so it's kind of neat. Verse 25, so David, the elders of Israel and the captains of a thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom, here it is, with joy. What a joy it is to serve God and, and to extol. And, and what, what kind of a parade this must have been, huh? And so it was when God helped the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, uh, that they offered uh, seven bulls and seven rams. David was, now check this out. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who bore the Ark. So David wasn't out there looking like a king. What did he look like? He looks like a priest here, doesn't he? And the singers, and it lists another fellow here, the guy in charge of the music, the music master with the singers. Uh, David also wore a linen ephod, also like a priest would wear. See, it's, uh, it appears as though during the millennial reign that David's going to be kind of like uh, the mayor, <laughs> uh, if you will, of Jerusalem. And I think I wouldn't be surprised if you're going to see David dressed looking like a priest, like here. And I wouldn't at all doubt if you don't see David with the same amount of exuberance and joy. We're going to, I'll probably, we'll probably see David dance, you know, and uh, as Christ, you know, uh, comes into Jerusalem. There's David, you know. Man, I can hardly wait to see that. Mm -hmm. Verse 28. Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn, the trumpet, with cymbals, making music, with stringed instruments. They just went all out to worship God. And it happened when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Michael, that was his wife given to him by Saul. Remember that? Saul's daughter. She was a sweetheart, wasn't she? Mm -hmm looked through the window and saw King David whirling and playing music and she despised him in her heart. Wow, that is deep, isn't it? Mm -hmm. She despised him in her heart. Of course, you can speak on this on several different levels from marriage or ministry, but can I say this? Sure. Let me just... Let me just give you a bottom line on this. Some folks just don't get praising God. <laughs> they just they just don't get it, you know. They'll go to a football game and paint themselves blue <laughs> to match and red or whatever color your team may be. And then they'll see a Christian worshiping God, the one true living God, and not worshiping the cowboys or whatever. And they'll go, what is wrong with those people? Uh, we were made to worship. <laughs> and if you're not going to worship the one true living God, you're going to be worshiping somebody else or something else. Uh, uh, as I look at Michael, I think to myself, well, 
she was probably, I think, she was probably thinking how, how crude, <laughs> you know. Uh, you would never, you wouldn't have caught my father, Saul, dead, you know, acting like that. And that's exactly right. And it's a shame Saul didn't humble himself in that same kind of a manner. So uh, here's uh, one more quote for you from Bible commentator Morgan, and he says, the incident, the incident illustrates the perpetual inability of the earthly minded to appreciate the gladness of the spiritual. Mm -hmm. That tags it perfect, doesn't it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for your goodness towards us, for your mercy and your love, Father. I thank you, Father, that you have uh, you have uh, preserved these chapters for us to look into tonight. Thank you for bringing them to us, Lord. And Father, my prayer is for myself and for my brothers and sisters as well, Lord, is that, Lord, you give me this kind of a heart of worship, a heart of worship like David had, Lord. And that, Father, we also would have that uh, alive, a daily relationship with you where we can call on you no matter what. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name and everybody said, Amen. Amen.